All right. Welcome to the third in the series of Signing Leadership. So this is Signing Science, but we're gonna be talking about academic leadership in deaf space. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming. And I would like to especially thank Dr. Matthew Dye for applying for and getting the funding to support this lecture series. Our goal with these lectures is not to talk about how to succeed. And it's not about the research itself either. These conversations are about how we lead people and how we get people to work together as a team, to work together happily and to work together creatively. When we think about who are deaf leaders, I immediately thought of Raja. He's the perfect example of a successful deaf leader. So we invited him to come and speak. Dr. Raja Kushalnagar is an expert in the field of access technology and social technology. He's a professor and director of the Department for in Information Technology at Gallaudet. He runs and leads an undergraduate program a graduate program, as well as an undergraduate summer program. He has many publications in his field regarding captioning, what is effective captioning and how to evaluate that. He's also published the right to language access as well. So today we're here to see how Raja interacts with one of his colleagues, Dr. James Waller. James has his PhD from the University of Chicago in linguistics. And so now Dr. Waller is working in accessible information, working for the Accessible Information Communication Center, AICT. And so today I'd like to welcome both of them. Thank you for coming. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off so Dr. Waller and Dr. Kushal Nagar can turn their cameras on. So Raja, could you please um, talk about yourself and your experience growing up and how did you get into your field of study? What interested you in that? Sure, uh, growing up deaf, uh, my parents had found out I was deaf when I was, um, I had gone to a small private school and I grew up with the same friends and teachers along my educational journey. And so it was fairly successful. What helped as well was my love of reading. And so English was my first language and it just so happened, you know, my name is Raja. Kushala Nagar, couldn't speak it clearly myself, right? However, I really cared about spelling names correctly. So for example, when I was reading and listening, I got used to, or I should say addicted to science through reading. And I really appreciated and wanted to know more about the hows and the whys of things and how they worked really want to know how the world works. So when I look back on my experiences, it really started with my love of reading, my love of conversation, and my parents really helped instill that and reinforce that love of wanting to learn the hows and whys. And science really encourages that anyway. So it felt very natural to me. And I had friends that uh, were very like-minded. And again, coming from a small community, I was able to interact with people fairly effectively. 
Now, this was, of course, growing up before the ADA, before we had laws protecting us, but all in all, it was a pretty good experience. Wonderful. So you got to college, you decided you wanted to major in computer science. Um, how does that relate to access technology? How did that help you get to where you are today as a researcher? So when I went to the University of California in Berkeley, I studied physics. It was great. But again, this is prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So there were no uh, formal access services. So I missed a lot of information in the classroom. And it was a big state university. So I relied on old strategies. Or I tried to rely on old strategies, but that only worked mostly for small academic environments. Once I went to a large state school, I did take some classes in computer science. Once I graduated with my degree in physics, I was uh, looking for a, a job in the uh, computer field, not physics. I, I did like computers and I wasn't sure which way I wanted to go. So I did ultimately decide on a graduate degree at RIT in computer science. And they provided access services like interpreters and note takers and things like that. So, so I've been in computer science ever since. In the computer science field, it, it, it seemed kind of like a zigzag journey, right? I started in the actual physical sciences, physics, and I moved my way into computers. Very interesting to hear how you got there. Um, people's journeys are always really interesting. Um, so now, I'd like to hear a little bit about your research right now. So what are, um, how did you get from physics to computer science and how does that relate to the research that you do? Sure. So my doctorate was on access, uh, accessible technologies. And so I recognized it involved a lot of social aspects and also a lot of collaboration. And I really wanted to not just have the accessible technology part, but I wanted to find out how those could be successful technologies for deaf and hard of hearing people. So I wanted to be additive and collaborative in my approach, whether that related to deaf and hard of hearing people's um, auditory abilities, their speech abilities. I wanted to really encourage a co-designing and participation in everything I did so that it ran the spectrum of diverse needs. What is most effective as far as access technology? I just also wanted to add and that, uh, that collaboration can happen with a lot of different fields. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by co-design and participation, please? Sure, it uh, you know, used to be that designing technologies, uh, deaf people were not considered in those developments. Once a design was definitive, deaf people were, if lucky considered an afterthought, they weren't even really considered in the process. So for example, I'm thinking of signing gloves. It doesn't really solve a problem that deaf people have. <laughs> right, it doesn't address any everyday challenges of language, communication barriers, right? It's a very niche research area. So I wanted to figure out how can we avoid those things? How can we include and invest in deaf people? How can we include them in the design and development of these technologies? And so that's what I mean by participatory design. The problem with that approach is that sometimes it's really easy to make mistakes in the design process and you might waste some time. 
So instead you wanna invite deaf people to be co-creators in that process. So if they don't have the technological background or knowledge, it can be difficult, but it's, an, it's a potential area of growth for deaf people and for the field. So by including high school and college and also graduate students, you then can create the space where you can co-design and co-create those technologies to find those intersectionalities where everybody's perspective is included, whether that's deaf, hearing, hard of hearing. So it's really valuable to get all those perspectives, not just a limited view of your audience. So shifting to, you know, deaf people truly participating in the research, having deaf people on the research team and leading the research. So I feel like that segues really well into the next question. So for you, how do you feel like your research is growing into the community as a deaf researcher? Well, starting with access technology design, I have noticed there's often not enough uh, alternatives or substitutions included in the technology. So, so oftentimes people are improvising, like students are trying to figure out ways to propose or fund new research, new technology together. So there's a lot of trial and error and those trials and errors will lead to some successes. And I do have some monies and funds that are able to help support those trial and errors. So we start with a team of people, right? And as a team, we proceed and become oriented to what we're trying to develop. So I've been involved with a project, I think close to 10 years now. There's a hundred undergrad students and 10 graduate students, right? And we're all in this together as a team, co-creating and developing these various approaches to access accessible technologies. So I know a little bit, you know, about your program to disclose to the audience. They used to be involved in the summer research program. I think it was what, maybe six or seven years ago. Yeah, I think about 2015, 2016. Was that your first year having it? I think it was uh, the year before, yes. Okay. So do you mind talking a little bit about that program, the undergraduate summer research program? Sure. It's supported by the National Science Foundation. And so what we try to do is provide research experiences for undergraduate students. And we pay them a full stipend, uh, provide them room and board for 10 weeks. So they get the full immersion experience on the team. There's an orientation about, you know, what are research questions? What are we gonna look at? And we do it together as a group and how we're gonna approach it. All of that is explained. Those presentations and poster sessions to support them for later work in the field. So it gets them thinking about graduate school. And a high number of students do consider it once they've experienced this program, because maybe they hadn't experienced until they get the research opportunity. So they learn how to apply for grants, how to do research, and I know several students have gotten their own NSF awards, National Science Foundation awards for these experiences in undergraduate research. Yeah, for me, the RAU is a fascinating experience. And I think RAUs are typically uh, what there's 10 to 12 students per year. I think back in my time, 
it was half deaf and half hearing, I believe. Is it still like that? Yes, it's still very collaborative. The one thing that has changed, you know, RIT was more, I think, open. There was no particular deaf space that was leading the way, but it was still a pretty open process. I think deaf and hearing and hard of hearing people all collaborating together to assess or analyze problems and then develop the most inclusive solutions for everybody involved. So, you know, wondering, you know, looking back on my own experience, it's really interesting. So half and half felt like it was really important to have that collaborative process, not having an entirely deaf group or just, you know, one or two. I think that it's really interesting and important that it was half and half, or do you think it was important to have that balance and not have it, you know, all deaf? I think the approach was set up that way because we recognized, I mean, I had been in several undergraduate research uh, programs myself prior to this. And I know there was one deaf participant in the REU program and nine hearing participants. So I know that because of that one deaf participant, right, I think that person was included as best as possible. However, we needed interpreters and we still only had a limited number of, we had a limited amount of time. And so I think the amount of speaking and listening involved, the socialization aspect, I don't know if it was the most effective research environment for that one deaf participant. There wasn't an ability to, you know, brainstorm and be organic in their conversations. It, it got frustrating at times, I think. You know, again, that's when that concept of critical mass started to spread. It's really important to have people that share identities such as language preference, communication preferences working together in a group because that critical mass of like-minded and language users helps people become more innovative and creative. And so we wanted to focus on creating a deaf space because we wanted to include that deaf perspective. And we didn't want people to feel that there was something superior or inferior in regards to your hearing status. And so we decided on half and half for both the participants and the mentors, because we wanted to have a good balance of all perspectives when we talk about accessible technologies. Communication access, and the contributions that are successful. And that's kind of been the formula of what we've been doing at Gallaudet. Yeah, honestly. And another thing about my past experience, you talked a little bit about critical mass and I found that that experience with the REU was really interesting. And I remember half of the people being hearing and not from RIT, I think most people um, came to work with one instructor. I think, I think most people came from a perspective of, of blindness. And so I think that was really interesting as well. There were so many people who were deaf and I think having that you know half and half made it great. And I think that it added a unique perspective I think that there were some hearing students who signed, we were all deaf, but there were times where there was no interpreters. And so sometimes leaving the meeting, it was really frustrating because they weren't able to understand everything. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly how deaf people feel when they don't have access. And so it was nice to have, you know, deaf people there working together, but also having hearing people who were able to intermingle and get this additional perspective. And I think that they were able to learn a lot more about sign language. And I think that if it were um, more lopsided, it would have been harder. And I think that 
I think that as well, having that critical mass uh, got people to sort of accommodate to us as part of the group as well and not, you know, the other way around. Yeah, let me just add to what you're saying. The feedback we've gotten from the participants so far that are doing research for deaf accessibility. Again, the point we emphasize is you're doing research with deaf people, not for deaf people. We wanna really empower people to be doing the research together. Yes, that's interesting to think about the power of that frame in decision-making. It's not just about you know helping deaf people, it's about deaf people having the power, you know, participating in that as well. So we talked a little bit about the REU, we talked a little bit about mentorship. Can we talk a little bit about successful mentorship? What makes it successful? Yeah, we provide a full orientation and training in the program and what we expect participants will be doing. There's research ethics. That's really an important part of being in the cohort is people working together in the lab whether that's in the summer or during the academic year. So part of my experience working with the participants in research, uh, uh, particularly related to access technologies is that co-designing collaboration. We know technology changes and evolves very rapidly. You know, for example, right now, we're working on a personal assistant that works on speech recognition and we're reaching out to researchers or we're trying to include researchers who are deaf and hard of hearing, who don't speak, who use sign language. And so the goal for this personal assistant technology is to use, hopefully within the next 10 years, You know, if we compare what we had about like a hundred years ago with silent movies, right? There was no audio and deaf and hearing people had the same access to movies. They were all silent. That was really cool. Right. And we would get, you know, a hundred years ago, we get our news of the day and we'd access it the same way in a newspaper. And then in 1927, we started adding audio to movies. And within a few years, all movies had become auditory, right? Speaking. And so that created a barrier for deaf people to access films. So we were dreaming of a time where we would have captions added to films, right? It hadn't happened for quite some time. And deaf people were not part of that design process. They weren't asked for 50 years until the 1970s. And then we finally had captions to access films and television. And so we don't want that to happen again. We're hoping that co-design and co-development can prevent that kind of barrier from happening again. We want to increase the number of deaf people in the field of technology and science. I mean, as recently as 2000, the number of deaf people in technology fields with PhDs or mathematics or any kind of STEM field, I would say about the middle of the early 2000s, we started to see more and more. PhDs, deaf, uh, deaf people in PhD programs in technology fields. And so that can really open up doors and opportunities for a lot of people. And that opens up doors for them to go into private industry. So it's not only about the training they receive, it's really about opening the door to future possibilities.
That's a really interesting summary of, you know, for example, how technology has changed and it used to be beneficial to deaf people. Um, but then sometimes the advent of technology creates new barriers for deaf people and limits our access. Um, and so what you're talking about now, you know, thinking about your own research and talking about like the Alexa or personal assistance or something like that, um, there's the sign up. And so like changing these fields, these voice recognition fields to make them more accessible to deaf people. So I'm wondering what kind of technology do you see coming on the horizon that we can be thinking about moving forward in the next 20 years or so that might be beneficial? And what are some things that you think we might need to be careful about? Artificial intelligence is huge already it's going to continue to be a thing it's a part of everyday life it's part of our culture right self-driving cars maps speech recognition sign recognition there are a lot of branches under this technology field there's a lot of barriers and biases involved and so we have to increase the number of deaf people in these fields and also have some ethical standards. And so we do need to be careful as AI becomes more prevalent and impactful on society, we, might, we have to make sure we're including more diverse lenses into those fields. So for example, one really simple example, Apple has those emojis with facial expressions and they're really cool, right? We learn facial expressions, right? We can copy those kind of linguistic non-manual markers. So one recommendation we could have for Apple is, you know, you should really include this in your product. And so if they don't take into that representational feedback, they're gonna be behind the ball, behind the, behind the mark. There was one person in the Q&A that specifically mentioned um, artificial intelligence. And I wanted to ask about, you know, sign recognition. How is that going? And what do you think about that project? I know, I know I'm jumping ahead to the q and I'm pulling it in right now, but we brought up artificial intelligence. So I wanted to ask. Yeah, we're, we're spending millions of dollars right now speech recognition technologies, even though it's not perfect, we're still behind. And so I think it's easy to overpromise and overlook things. And it really can be a detriment to signing people. We have to really consider the equity and the ethics involved in this process. Also consider the privacy the signed information that we present, the signers, how we are providing those signs in that language, is it acceptable? Meaning, and what I mean by that, does it meet minimum standards for appropriate application? You know, we have use cases of signers. We have to make sure that those are acceptable. Do we need to modify or tweak those at any point? You know, signs for simple information like quick responses, like, you know, what time is the train coming? We probably don't need to have that perfect facial expression, but if we're gonna be using it for open-ended conversations, it's tough, right? You can't just have one rule that fits all, right? We need to think about how and what we're providing through the AI, through that technology. And I think that's related to a project that you're working on. And so if we're developing the technology, you know, we still have the ADA. So how can we pull into that technology to make sure that we are 
using it for access, but also following appropriate ADA accommodations and, you know, laws in general. That's something that I think we don't talk about a lot. Yes, I think now more and more we're using those automatic speech recognition, uh, ASR for short. Some they're used in perfect situations and they seem to work very well. But when you consider accents or background noise, things that can interfere with it, it falls apart. And so we have to figure out, well, where's the problem? And is it going to meet the standards of the Americans with Disability Act? Does it meet the standards for accessibility? We have to push back on these things, not just in the technology fields, but in the legal field as well and how it applies to everyday life. I mean, so right now we have artificial intelligence and we're working on creating that recognition in sign language, but does it meet those standards? So it seems that in your own research, we've shifted to including artificial intelligence. I guess I'm wondering how and why you started to make that transition. Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, previously on my research journey, I decided, well, you have to decide what your priorities are. Mm -hmm. And I started in access technology because it already had a strong foundation of collaboration and we could develop a good frame for this collaboration in a training program, especially with undergrad researchers and then leading them into graduate school. So it's been two years and I have noticed more artificial intelligence making an impact on accessible technologies. And I do see a shift in research with accessible technologies in relation to sign language. I did get a grant to address this problem where we look at the, eth the ethical equivalence plus additional collaboration in AI, which is becoming very popular. Right? It's not just related to one technology, but philosophical and legal issues have arisen because of AI. And I think it's a really powerful shift. And we're trying to welcome a lot of diverse lenses into that discussion and into that field. I find that really interesting. And I think that this leads to a couple of questions that I want to ask, but for one, So you talked about this grant, which is, you know, the project that I work with you on a few years ago. And so people on that grant were involved with computer science and linguistics and philosophy. So how do you bring together people from different fields and how do you cultivate that collaboration when people come from such diverse backgrounds? Like how do you frame that, that working together, that cooperation and collaboration with people from different fields? Everybody has different backgrounds and frames that they bring to the table. And I think the key is the solidarity and the collaboration with each other and having that deaf experience, sign language ability. And so once we have the same goal in mind and we reach a consensus, then everybody can contribute in ways that are meaningful from their backgrounds. You know, from their frame of reference with their backgrounds, hopefully everybody can contribute what's necessary and it will fit together perfectly. Because, you know, for example, I don't have a background in the linguistics, right? But somebody does. And so if we can bring my knowledge of computer science and AI and their knowledge of linguistics, right? Having that interdisciplinary approach is effective. 
And I think that's today's world. You can't be your own silo of information. You need to really branch out. I really like how you frame that. It's important to come to a consensus on what the issue is and then go from there to solve the problem, right? And then you can bring in the different perspectives. And because of that, you have all of the tools you need to work on that project. You know, I'm really impressed by, you know, the collaborations with philosophy and computer science and linguistics. I think that's really great. Yeah, I just wanted to add, it's really important also, it, people need the necessary training first, obviously, Absolutely. in a particular field. Once they've got the training that applies to their field, once they know how to propose research questions and come up with problem solving, once they come up with solutions for those problems, and then they want to apply this to things like access technology, that's when you can really set up an interdisciplinary project. But at the same time, it, it, you do have to keep uh, your own frame, your own lens, but making sure everybody's on the same level. I think you've talked about this a little bit before, but you have some undergraduate as well as PhD students who have gone through this. Um, and you've talked a little bit about, you know, interdisciplinary. Um, could you talk a little bit about, so you mentioned the important training in your field. And I think with that, I think especially for PhD students, it's really important for them to have that experience in their field, you know, and then they can develop that expertise in that field. And so I wonder what that means to you and what that's going to look like in the future for PhDs. Yeah, for PhDs, well, and undergraduate students. There's two parts, really. You have the academic part and the social part. Now, the academics are, are very strong. You need a strong foundation in the field and how you apply that to the field. You also need to work, learn how to work with people within a group. Right, you're not, you're typically not going to be alone in research, especially as you move up the academic ladder. And so by the time you become a senior in your undergrad program, you've considered what you want, you've made connections and networked, maybe had internships, you have resources available to kind of guide you into what you may wanna do. And so if you apply to a graduate program, they don't typically teach you those soft skills, those social skills, right? Those are things you learn outside of class. So, you know, effective mentoring, that is really where deaf students often miss out. So that's where programs like RU, undergraduate research, can really give them the upper hand and give them the resources that they may not have known were available to them to help them prepare for graduate studies. Whether that's what tests do I have to take? Do I need letters of recommendation? How or what programs should I apply to? Are they deaf friendly schools or not, right? Just these things you wanna think about for later. Sometimes it's too late. So in your undergrad program, if you have the time to do that, to learn those things, you'll be much more prepared for a graduate level of study, right? What the value of publishing your research is, how to do it. Universities are collaborating together. You know, when I was going through my PhD program, if we didn't connect with the universities in Washington, DC, maybe we're connected with universities in Texas, but the problem was they didn't have any signing or deaf people involved. And so I think those connections are really valuable. That's really one of the most important parts of the program is to provide the successful academic foundations, but also the social. 
Yes, thank you so much for that. It's, you know, really interesting to hear about how important that network is with research experiences. Especially in my own PhD work, if I know that there's another deaf person there and I can ask questions and sort of expand my network through other people, like how, who do I talk to about this? Like if I want to apply for something, like how do I do that? And I think that, you know, a lot of that learning happens outside of the classroom. And I think about that a lot as a deaf person and like, how am I going to get that experience? Is there anything else you'd like to share before I open it up to the Q&A? Yeah, I just wanted to comment about, you know, thinking about research, you, you students really should expect frustrations and some, and some problems along the way. Right. And you you talked about, you know, getting a grant and you talked about, you know, some of the times you've applied for funding and it hasn't worked out. Um, and so you kind of have to move on to what's next. Like you're not really stuck into those situations that aren't working out. Sometimes you, you know, you have to push back a little bit, but you have to know how much and you have to pick your battles. You're also doing a lot of, um, you know, you're trying to sell yourself and, and convince people why this is an important project. You know, especially for grants, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they're turned down. Sometimes you get the money, sometimes you don't. You submit for publication and sometimes you're rejected. And sometimes what they do, especially with publications, is they give you feedback and you say, thank you very much. And you go back to the, the, the drawing board and you try again. And the one thing I always impress upon my students, don't let perfectionism get in the way of your progress. Yes, very important. <laughs> I'm still learning that myself. I mean, a lot of undergrads think I have to do this perfectly or it's not successful, but that's not true. Because it's really about pushing the boundaries of your own knowledge to increase that knowledge over time. You can learn from your mistakes and your errors and just accept them and move on. Because part of the journey is learning from those mistakes, from getting that feedback from writing that paper. And that's how you can rate your success. A lot of different proposals and ideas have been accepted and rejected. But the key is to keep going, to let people know you're there and what you're doing. Thank you so much. I'm going to take an opportunity to read some of the questions from the Q&A. Missy asked about, yes, audio and sign recognition. So I think it's really interesting, you know, again, going back to, you know, graduate school and PhD work, I think you know, you have to juggle a lot of different things, right? We talked about research, we talked about projects, we talked about ethics, mentoring students, teaching. So how do you prioritize everything and how do you manage everything that you have to do at the same time? Yeah, it's harder. Uh, the, more, the more you climb the ladder, the more responsibilities you have. So it does become a question of efficiency in your daily work. And often you get less time <laughs> in some ways and it feels like a heavier burden and that comes faster than you think. There's different levels of support. Uh, you know, it could be peer mentoring. It could be a, an official formal mentorship or it could be running a project in collaboration with other faculty, with other full professors. It could be running a lab, training people to work in the lab, proposing paper ideas, again, with the goal in mind 
is to increase their own role in that project and increase their growth potential in that lab. So I think the key is mentoring, support in the lab, and support overall in the program. I think some of the questions are about your research. Some of them are about, you know, ASL recognition. So I'm wondering in your own work, in your field, is it specifically with ASL recognition or are you veering a little bit? We're working on the foundations of ASL recognition. The rules, the controls, the solutions, we're collecting all that data right now and building our models for ASL recognition. Let me just give you an example. We're collecting video clips of ASL students, giving, you know, collecting screenshots of those sign language clips with students, some interpreters, uh, and but some of those clips do contain a little bit of bias. And so we're using those as models for ASL recognition. But one of the things that's missing is the way to modify or improve it. So right now we're doing research, we're, we're conducting, we're actually proposing research that will focus on the development of the technology, but then there's a separate research related to the rules and the controls, all the behind the scenes stuff of the technology. So it seems like the really important point is to keep moving with the technology and research and it will continue to apply to technology today. And I think sometimes, you know, you also have to consider what laws are involved, but it's a good place to get started. So one person asked a question about technology and I'm wondering as well, the question was about augmented reality. And so someone asked, do you feel like that is a barrier in this process, like VR. And I'm wondering how you think that'll affect the future of access. Yeah, that's actually a really exciting possibility because we need all of these diverse perspectives involved. So for example, if we have like an avatar, a signing avatar or a speaking avatar, We want to know, is it going to be the same, whether you're hearing or deaf, or will it be different? Are the rules and the controls, the bias, the ethics, what does that look like? Does that change if the person is speaking or signing? Would it be the same facial expressions? And then we have another team of people create, you know, working on that. I think that's really within our lifetime. I think within a generation, Maybe, maybe another 10 years, we'll probably have something like that available. I think, you know, one, one practical thing, and I think it would always be, you know, nice. So for deaf people working with interpreters, I'm wondering how we negotiate that relationship between, you know, interpreters and deaf people. I'd like to, you know, reframe that specifically thinking about PhD students um, or people working towards their PhDs with interpreter access. I noticed that often with hearing mentors, it can be challenging. So do you have any tips or, you know, like if you have deaf people working with interpreters, I'm wondering how deaf people can get access in the academic environment. Yeah, I've gone to deaf spaces in regards to PhD studies. It's, it's kind of nerve wracking sometimes because I will have an interpreter, you know, and they have 
uh, equal footing as far as vocabulary and jargon and knowledge. But of course, sometimes that won't happen. And so you'll be on uneven uh, ground as far as the fund of knowledge with an interpreter. But it's really, it's really vital to have that preparatory time, the training, the know-how to understand the problems that they're gonna be talking about. So it's not just the academic or technical knowledge that they're going to be facing. They have to understand the problems ahead of time, what the research is about. Maybe it's not a formal presentation. It could also happen in social situations when people are talking to each other about their particular fields. I think information can sometimes be lost in translation. And so sometimes if you don't have that direct communication available, there is a possibility to have that uh, translation misunderstood. So that's why it's really important to have, if you have the space and the opportunity to have deaf spaces available so people can talk directly to each other about it. And there's less opportunity for error and mistakes. And of course, you can always follow up with email or some kind of written communication to clarify. But it, it is nice to be able to provide effective communication through interpreters as well if you don't have direct communication at the moment. Thank you so much. I think that is all that we really have time for. This is, you know, has been a really great conversation with you. Um, I think there's one more question that I wanted to ask. So, you know, one person in the Q&A asked, who are your mentors? You know, as you're trying to navigate through your journey, you know, working with mentors, colleagues, students, um, who is somebody that helped you get to where you are today? Well, like I mentioned before, I think my parents really instilled a love of science for me. I think the connections I was able to make in Washington and also at RIT in the, in the PhD program, if I ever felt stuck. And then I think after my collaborative experiences at Gallaudet and RIT, really they promoted that collaboration and that access. And of course, students have made a huge impact, especially the students I work with in the REU, the undergraduate program. Thank you so much. I certainly count you as a mentor in my own experiences, both in the REU and today. I think that that's all that we have time for. Any last comments before we wrap up? I also wanted to thank Rain. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to have this conversation. Rain is saying, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm over here nodding along and listening to everything that you all are saying in agreement. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I hope you like the format. I'm imagining like, you know, you're sitting by a fire, having coffee, maybe a glass of wine and just enjoying a conversation. Thank you so much for allowing us to watch this natural dialogue that you all had about leadership. Thank you, Raja, for sharing all of your expertise with all of us. And thank you, James, for your wise and insightful questions. I'd like to thank everyone so much for attending this lecture series made possible by an award from the provost office from Dr. Granberg's office. So we'd like to thank her very much for that. And I'm very much looking forward to future lectures. Thank you, everyone. Take care.